here, but I'm very happy to be here and talk a, a little bit about all these topics. So actually, I'm, I have many links, I would say, between the projects and between the topics of the projects. <laughs> um, first of all, I, I work in Hokoma, which is a company that, that manufactures rehabilitation of robotics. Uh, as you see in the image already, but I will tell a little bit more in our portfolio also. I'm, um, I was involved also in Technalia. I worked in Technalia before. That's an open link that I have for all of this. I'm also involved in a, a granted EIH hero project, like one of these two party projects, where we actually integrate also virtual reality with uh, rehabilitation robots. And that's an other link with the Rehype uh, project, I would say. So, um, yeah, for me it's very interesting and I'm very happy to be here, but I hope also for you it's interesting what I will talk about in this context, which is focused more on uh, regulation and standards in this uh, field. And I put, I changed the title a little bit because I put some remarks also on this topic of interoperability and putting different devices together or let them uh, interact. Um, yeah, so a bit about Valcoma. Um, we aim to provide a total solution for neuro rehabilitation or functional movement therapy, as we call it. And you see here an image where we see a kind of robotic clinic with more patients than therapists. And uh, every so here we see lower extremity, gait and balance devices, we see arm rehabilitation, we see overground devices. Um, Lot of different things, but we also see that relatively low number of therapists can serve more patients, and we think that's like a vision for the future that we can support the balance between demand and supply of neural rehabilitation in an aging uh, society. That's, so that's a long term vision, and this is our mission statement. For so we are focused on three different topics, um, most of all, two. One is solutions for gait and balance rehabilitation, so lower extremity, and then arm and hand solutions, upper extremity, and a few topics related to strength, coordination, and endurance. But I would say the first two are, are the main focus. Then we offer a platform that we call OpoNet, which is a software uh, management system for patient data, for example, and for uh, collecting results from the devices for planning the therapy. So that is supposed to connect all devices also to one platform and it's, that's in development, but we have first version of that now available. And that links, of course, very much to this topic of interoperability. And then we provide many services to our customers, like uh, clinical support, in how to use the devices and training, research services to support clinical research, uh, and well, all the logical things that the company does. So, a bit about the portfolio. So, so we always try to cover uh, a range of functionality in a patient and provide a solution for early phase of a neuro rehabilitation until uh, late phase. And that's also something in development, but that's uh, the goal to have a total solution, basically. And here you see the ARM device uh, range where we have for the most severe patients, uh, here indicated with some clinical scale, but that's not really the point. It just goes from severe to, to normal functioning. Armeo Power is a completely actuated uh, arm rehabilitation robot that can provide movement. Uh, so for early mobilization and for robotic movement support. That's an active robot. Then we have a, a, a device, Armeo Spring, that only supports the body or the weight of the arm. So it's a weight compensation device, it does not actuate. But it offers also the same kind of feedback games, for example. So there's a level of integration and uh, reduction of complexity and of uh, yeah, robotic aspects. So that's a gravity compensation. And then, sorry, we have the Armeo sensor, which is purely sensor-based device that only gives feedback and measures movement. And that could even be used at all. Actually, in the context of COVID, we also had a Happy Guys Hero project 
bij wie dit uh, a feasibility study of using a male sensor for all the implementation. That's not reality, but that's a vision, let's say, at this point. For, for uh, gait and balance, we have similar for very severe patients, Irigo and Lopomat, completely uh, uh, yeah, supported uh, devices that can provide all the necessary movement. And then we have a range of, of devices, uh, Andaro, Rise, and Cmail, that basically provide different ways of body weight support. The Andaro is an overground device that is a mobile robot that can drive around and that follows the patient and provides safety and weight support. And the Rise and, and Cmail actually are products from, from Motec. I didn't tell you, but Alcoma is part of a, a, a corporation called DIH. And that consists also of Motec company, which is a Dutch company that makes uh, advanced treadmills with virtual reality solutions that are used a lot in gait and balance research, but also in rehabilitation. So we have now the, the branding where Hokoma is the clinical brand selling devices to clinics for rehabilitation and Motec selling for, for research applications. Um, but because the Ryzen and CMIL are also products that are clinically relevant to provide rehabilitation to patients. We also sell them on the Lokoma uh, uh, flag, still branded as Motec, but uh, yeah, we, we have them in our portfolio. So the Ryzen is a, a room integrated system that also gives body weight support and safety, and you can basically freely walk around. Um, also coupling that to virtual reality, for example, or projections on the floor. Also the C-mail has a treadmill with projections on the floor, for example, surfaces that you have to step on or that you have to avoid to train more advanced patients in, in reactive uh, balance. So also uh, kind of a full range where the most for most severe patients, we have robotic solutions. And um, yeah, I, I said same active robots. You, it moves, the treadmill also moves, the body weight support system also moves, so it has some robotic aspects. So, yeah, Hokoma was a pioneering uh, company in this field, I would say. So, so um, we started with the Lokomat, great rehabilitation robot. Um, and currently, we're very much involved by the transfer of MDD, Medical Device Directive, to Medical Device Regulation, which is a new European re uh, yeah, regulation for this type of devices. And also, your all devices have to be certified according to the MDR. But the difference there are that the notified bodies much more in depth look at your uh, documentation. There are new requirements, and I will go a bit into details of that. Um, there are uh, new applicable standards, and there are also topics addressed that are actually not so well covered, like cybersecurity, which causes also a big. Uh, Concerns. So medical robotics, um, wide field. The baseline is of course that you have a robotic device, whatever, however you define that, that is applied as a component of a medical device or a, or a medical device. That means of course that there's an interaction because medical device means there is a patient involved and usually also an operator. So there are two points of interaction between uh, human and uh, system. So safety is, of course, a, a very important consideration in this interaction. Um, and then the questions that you have to ask, of course, is there a physical contact? You can also think of a scanner device that's a kind of robot without any direct contact. But a locomat is connected to the legs of the patient and moves it around. So there's really a physical interaction. Uh, also, the therapists may interact with the patient, so they also touch the device. So, so yeah, there is safety issues related to that. And also, we have to ask then, is the operator, or they already pointed as in the same physical space? So in this case, the Vinci robot, usually the operator is away from the process. But in the locomat, the therapist will put the hands in the system, interact with it. That's also an important safety concern. Um, yeah, then a bit about the regulation, and everyone has a different background on that, so I hope I'll say something new or something useful. But 
uh, I take a bit the picture of uh, how to get a, a research result to the market, basically. And the directives in Europe, so the legislation, basically requires you to demonstrate safety and performance of your own device. That's really the baseline. And it also asks you to use state-of-the-art approaches to show uh, performance and safety. And that's where standards come in. So standards are supposed to reflect the state of the art of how do you do something or how do you implement something or what can you consider safe. And yeah, in Europe, then if you fulfill the directive requirements, you can get the CE mark, and that's basically the point where you uh, stay compliance with the legislation. So and like I said already, of course, in robots, human-robot interaction is a, is a key point uh, there. So a bit more about standards in the context of the, the legislation. So you have the directives and they are, all are defined where they apply. So you have a medical device directive that always applies to medical devices, obviously. But for a robot, also the machinery directive applies because that's a legislation for everything that is defined as a machine. EMC directive could apply electromagnetic uh, compliance. Um, low voltage directive could apply. So you always have to see which laws are relevant for my device. And it's from robots, never alone the medical device regulation. But that's the most important one. Then, if you want to apply and show compliance with this legislation, like I said, it asks you to use the state of the art to show safety, for example, and that's where standards come in. Um, Europe has a process of harmonization where they state these and these standards can be used to show compliance with the legislation. That's called harmonized standards and that's called presumption of conformity. That means if you apply these standards, you know that you comply with the law. Um, a big problem in the NDR is that they already made the NDR active, but there are very few harmonized standards at this point. So nobody knows what is actually the standards that you should uh, apply for many things. But in principle, you have to use the latest published standards. But harmonization means that the Senelec and Senelec tests if there's no contradiction between the law and the standard. And the current latest standards are not yet checked with the NDR. So that, that's always a struggle for a company. Can we really use the standards? But normally, if you use harmonized standards, you comply with them, you have a test report, then you can proceed and, and get into a declaration of conformity and a CE mark. So the end point is getting a CE mark. Then, um, so the standards are very important to show this compliance. So where do standards come from? Um, there are many uh, institutes and organizations uh, involved in, in uh, creating standards. So important for this safety and performance are IEC and ISO. Uh, and there's a bit of division between both. So, so IEC is more electric, electrical device oriented and ISO all the best, I would say. But there are other organizations, but that's the international level. But then on European level, you have for each organization a kind of copy with the same scope, but for a, a smaller uh, jurisdiction. So, so you have ISO then translated to the SEN, IC to the SENELEC, they are for Europe, and they take care of this harmonization step. And then on a national level, I feel the Swiss example, but every country in Europe also has a national institute that then also makes a national version of all these standards and makes it sometimes the law in the country. Um, and then you have had many other uh, organizations also producing standards. I put a few that are relevant in the robotics field, IEEE, but that sometimes goes more to, to kind of best practice standards, so that they have not the normative level of, of an ISO standard usually. ASME, the ISTA for transport, ASTM, um, yeah, I will not go into the detail of all these organizations, but they produce standards that can also be relevant. Then a bit on how do standards uh, are 
yeah, so, so like I said, um, ISO IC are very important. And in our field, the ISO is traditionally taking care of robotics. So that's more the mechanical side of that. While medical electrical equipment, so that's the electrical, but also the medical side of it is traditionally an IEC domain. So medical robotics is really in between both. And that's why a, a joint working group uh, was put together that uh, started creating standards specifically for medical robotics. And also Goodwinder was very much involved in this. Um, and there were in the end two groups, one for surgery medical robotics and one for rehabilitation medical robotics. Um, it's a bit complex because they have different numbers. There are two groups in IEC world. There's one group in ISO uh, world. In ISO, it's called working group five. In IC, it's called working group 35 and 36, but it's one entity, so to say, that produced now some standards for medical robots. And they have been published in 2019, and they are actually already being harmonized in Europe. So soon they will be uh, required for European uh, NDR uh, compliance. If your system is in the scope of the standards. So what is a working group? It's just every country can send people to a, a working group. There are people with many different backgrounds. I put here like medical device industry is of course always represented. Also test institutes participate consultants that help uh, companies, regulators, like the FDA, for example, is usually active. And I said a few lost academics because they often show up and disappear again because they may be participating in context of a research project. But this is a very slow, political, uh, long-term process. But the idea is that countries are represented, at least for ISO and IEC, and each country has a vote. And you have to reach a consensus, and when you reach a consensus, uh, you have a state of the art and so on, like safety of uh, medical robots for rehabilitation. Um, but yeah, it's a complex process and it takes a lot of time, and it's not always uh, exciting, let's say, for researchers. Um, but a bit, so now a bit about the intuition of the NDR. Um, you have to show that the benefit of your product outweighs the risk of using this product. That's, that's really the baseline. And then standards come into play. What does it mean? So you have, for example, as you saw already uh, earlier in the meeting of the re uh, risk management for medical devices. It's really the core of, of how you demonstrate safety of, of the system. And then you have specific add-ons, I would say, to this standards that tell you for a specific group of, of devices how to do the risk management, what you have to look at. And for medical electrical equipment, for medical devices is everything, also passive uh, tools, for example. But electrical equipment, so that has a source of power, the 60601 series of standards is the baseline. It's called general requirements for basic safety and essential performance. Um, and then you have to do your risk analysis and show that your device is safe, but you always have to put that in the benefit, in context of the benefit of your device. Um, and you have to prove also this benefit. So that's the, the other side. Uh, and then what you also always have to do is to follow then your product in the market. Um, and see if your risk management was maybe not correct and an accident happens and you have them to process that. But this you all, also all have to have in place before you can sell uh, a medical product. And it makes a lot of sense, of course, because a risk management file or a risk management process is based on estimations and you learn by using it first. Um, then what exactly is the route in the legislation depends on rules. And these rules see what is actually the level of risk of the device. That's called the risk class. And there's a rule nine talking about active devices. And that means there's an exchange of power between the device and the human, very broadly de defined. And that's with the robot usually the case if the robot is interacting with the person. So then you have a class 2A device, or if it's really high risk, a class 2B. And then 
because of the class, you have a specific route of what is needed. So if you have a class one device, low risk, you can then declare on your own as a company that you comply with the legislation and you can do self, uh, uh, yeah, self declaration of conformity. But if you have specific type of class one for, um, but I have to look at my notes quickly. Um, mm -mm. Yeah, so sterile devices, that's the S, M is measurement devices and R is, is reusable devices. So that's specific type of devices. You need a notified body. Sometimes to a limited degree, class two active devices are considered high risk. And you always need to have your documentation inspected by a, a notified body that is appointed um, by Europe, by the countries. And then only that notified body can give you a declaration of conformity, and then you get a CD mark with a notified body number. Um, but yeah, for low cost sensing devices, you can do self declaration. Um, so a bit more detail. So you have to define very clearly what's the purpose of your device, what's the supposed clinical benefit, where is it used, in what context. Um, and then you have to demonstrate this. So usually you will have to do a clinical effect study, not always, depends on what you are claiming. Um, but that's a key point. You need to have a defined clinical performance, and then you have to do this risk assessment and show that patients are safe from harm. And yeah, like I said, that is the weighing. Does this justify the risk? Uh, does the benefit, benefit justify the risk? Um, and then follow the product in the field. Um, of course, then you can always, or you always have to ask the question, how much risk is actually too much or what's acceptable? And you see the one device that just measures the temperature. Um, so yeah, you can of course debate what is really the benefit of that. Um, but you also have life saving equipment that of course is a different class of device. And the level of uh, harm that you can accept is very different. So here, if you get a burn, no one cares about getting burns. But if you would uh, burn your ear by measuring the temperature, that would not be acceptable. That's really essential, and there's no absolute level of safety apart from the basic safety that is defined in the standard. But there's always a special safety that depends on the. So a lot of harms are acceptable, but it's not only the direct physical harm that you do, it can also be what's the effect of wrong information. So if you measure the temperature, but you would take wrong clinical decisions based on that. It can also be very harmful. So, so that aspect is also part of the story. So it, it's not only what the device does, but also what you suggest that can be done with the information. Like is it diagnostic or is it just informative? Uh, that's something about research and development and our standards and everything else. The basic difference is that you start with an idea and then you start to do research making an idea work. It's a lot of freedom. It's also a very exciting part. But as soon as you go to development, so to a product, everything changes because everything you do in this context has to be documented. And every change that you make has to be documented. Your things that you are doing have to be planned and, and documented. So you need to be really careful when you go from the research uh, reality to the development reality, because if you do that too early, you get lost in documents. If you do it too late, you don't have the proper documentation and you have to kind of reconstruct uh, reality. Uh, and in that context, it's also important to be aware if your goal is a product in the market. Um, yeah, when uh, do you uh, switch, but also what can you already do during research or what should you already do? And I listed a few things. So the design inputs is a formal document, so a requirement document that you should already work on during research uh, so that you clear have a clear picture of what actually the device has to fulfill and, and what are why certain specifications are important. 
Of course, you have to be aware of the state of the art. That's already important for research and publications. But also uh, in the documentation, uh, that's a, a base thing you have to do. Like in what play fields are you placing this uh, device? Of course, the more commercial protect IP. Um, also think about this regulatory strategy. What do I need? Clinical evidence. Uh, what is the class of my device? Or what is the path to, to the market in a regulatory sense? And then, of course, as a baseline, just very basic, how, how can it, my device hurt a patient? What can you go wrong? Because that often tended to be ignored, for example, with exoskeletons. Yeah. Um, the risk of falling, for example, is really a big topic, and you can ignore that for a while, but it will always come back, and then you have to somehow deal with that. So you should be aware of that, and also how you are going to deal with that in your risk benefit system. Yeah, draft all those plans, basically saying in development, you have has to have a, a development plan defined and a development uh, procedure process that has to be ready. Yeah, how to prove that your device actually works or the clinical uh, evaluation. And also very important usability. So user involved design gets more and more common practice in research. I think that's very important. It's also very important to just give it to naive users and see what they do. Again, is it intuitive already? Can they really understand what's the goal of this thing? Um, and yeah, industrial design then is already important to start with. So, apart from um, product requirement standards, it's also required that your company fulfills the standards and has a defined formal approach how the processes are run. There's a standard called ISO 13485, Medical Device Quality Systems. In the common world, that's the ISO 9001, Quality Systems. And that means you have to define every process in your company. And one of the requirements is that you have a structured development process and a, yeah, a production process and post market surveillance. Um, but it's not defined how you have to do that, so you can use uh, any kind of state-of-the-art system. And just give a quick example: what is a typical uh, development uh, process system that also in Alcoma we use? So we have first the user needs definition product uh, 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 document. We translate that in design input requirements. So that's more like technical specifications for your device. Then there's a, a design or development process where you build. A device uh, and linked with that you do all the time usability testing. It's called uh, formative usability testing. It's required by the standard also to do that and to report it. You work on your risk management process so you analyze what are the risks and um, try to make it intrinsically safe being aware of the risks or you try to implement risk controls and that's a circle. There's of course, a link between usability and risks and safety. Um, and if you conclude that your device is not yet safe, you have to add new uh, design input requirements or specifications. So it's an iterative process. At some point, you have a device, and then you start your verification process, or in this model at least, for each requirement. You verify is this requirement fulfilled? Maybe you have to do a technical test. That shows that this requirement is there, or you just have to inspect your design. But you have to document all of that. Every requirement that you defined has to be verified. If that's passed, you go to the next level, which is the validation, where you basically check are my user needs fulfilled. And that can also be done based on uh, Requirements. So, if you can, you, sometimes you can say this and this specifications are implemented, so I automatically fulfill my user need. Sometimes you have to go do a clinical trial and, and check if it really does something that you expect with the patient or whatever is your defined user. Um, and all of that is iterative, of course, because maybe you have to reduce your, your uh, claims, etc. Um, also, clinical trials very important. You can, of course, learn about the safety of your device. Maybe some accident happens that you didn't expect. Update, update your risk management. 
But when all of that in place, you proceed to the certification. Um, and that's very systematic. Everything's documented in this process. So that, that's uh, very important, I would say, not start to go. Um, risk management, just to give you a bit of the intuition of risk management process. First step is principal hazard analysis, where you basically define what are the classes of, of hazards, of, of accidents that can happen with my device. So if there's a high voltage, electrical shock is of course a basic thing. If there are moving parts, you have, of course, a mechanical accident uh, risk. Uh, and there can be data integrity issues. So that's a hazard analysis is just a list of maybe bio biological risk or biocompatibility. That, that's just a starting point. Then the next step is to access uh, to assess specific risks. Uh, and that's this, this standard 1.4971 uh, defines how that process should look like. But basically, what you have to estimate is what harm can occur, what's the severity of that harm, and what's the probability that that can happen. And then you define somewhere the range of what is a high risk and what's a low risk. Um, but it's up to the manufacturer to define. Uh, unless some standards tell you, like for electrical safety, you have this 601 is one standard. That says for electronic safety, you have to implement this. That's basic safety. And if you implemented that, your risk is acceptable. That is defined by that standard, and you don't have to worry about it. But there are a lot of specific risks in your device, of course, not listed in the standard. And then you have to take care that everything is acceptable in the end. Because what is acceptable, again, depends on the benefit. But, uh, you have to draw a border. And then you have to manage the risk. We consider your design. Can I make it intrinsically safe so that this hazard cannot occur at all? Can I implement risk controls, uh, alarm uh, belts, or uh, stop the device if, if I add a sensor system to stop it in time? Or information for use, give warnings to the user that they are aware of the risk. And it's always in this order. Uh, warning users is only allowed if you already uh, took this uh, higher level measures of making a safety device. But yeah, information for use or training of the user, etc., is of course also an acceptable strategy. And you have to go to the acceptable level, but it's in the MDR also a requirement that you reduce your risk as far as possible. Uh, and that's always a bit. Uh, complicated because what does that mean? What is possible? Um, yeah, but that's uh, up to the manufacturer. Then a bit about the 60601. So I, I said already 60601, electrical safety of medical electrical equipment. It's the base standard for any advanced medical device, so also robots especially. And there's one general standard but it's not one standard, it's a family of uh, 100 standards. Where you have the base standard, you have the collateral standards that uh, look at one aspect of devices, for example, electromagnetic uh, compliance or uh, use in a home uh, use environment or um, ecologically uh, compatible design or alarm systems. But these are what we call horizontal standards. So they apply in principle for each device, but not always. If that aspect is not relevant for your device, you have, don't have to consider it. Then you have particular standards that have a dash two coding, and they have a specific scope and they apply for one type of device. And there's now this rehabilitation robot standard. That's a type two standard. And there's also the surgical robot standard, also a type two standard. And these standards always overrule the other standards. So if there is a standard that applies for your device, uh, it overrules the general standard. Um, and it is basically the same standard with adaptation. So it says, for example, this clause of the general standard does not apply, or this clause of the general standard has to be understood for this type of device in this and this way. So it's an adaptation of the general standard for a specific device. And as there is now a, a, a 
standard for rehabilitation robots, you have to apply that. And it's kind of add on to the general standard, but it overrules it. So you have to consider. Important. Yeah, like I said, we have this. There's one standards, horizontal, cross application standards. We have the device specific. There's two standards. Actually, the rehabilitation robot one is called 80601 because it's joined with ISO. That's why they numbered it a bit different, but it's part of the family of 60601. And there's a lot of other stuff that I will not go into. Now. And it's all based on the, the risk management standard. And also very important is the software lifecycle standard that also for robots is key. But that's a different standard, 622304. That tells you basically how to document your software development. So it's more a process standard and uh, how to develop software and how to document that. But that's key point in, in robotics. Um, yeah, so, so like I said already, basically, but so if you have a robot, you have a medical electrical equipment. So you go to the 60601. But then you have these specific standards that specify more for uh, rehabilitation robots or um, re uh, surgical robots. And then there are these dash one standards, horizontal collateral standards that probably also apply like electromagnetic compatibility, usability engineering always applies. Home healthcare could apply software. Uh, there's a typo in the number, but that usually always applies to robots as well. And then on the score sets of standards, you will have to provide evidence that you comply with them, which means for a class two device, also for class one device, actually, you have to go to a certified test institute that is accredited to do these tests and that tests for you based on your documentation and on your device. If you fulfill the requirements, and then yeah, you have to provide cl clinical uh, evidence as well as, as based on what claims you want. Um, few remarks about interoperability. I have two minutes. Two minutes. Okay. Just to have some questions. Yeah, so I just wanted to say a bit if we now go from this regulatory uh, context to interoperability. Uh, yeah, what, what's the link? So what is legislation on this topic? I'm not an expert in it, and I'm not talking about this. Uh, well, I will say a few things about that, but it's really about how, how does it look from a regulatory uh, perspective. So let's say we have a local mat as a device, and we have an uh, FES uh, stimulator for drug food, and we want to use them uh, together in, in application. Um, first of all, a clinic can always decide, we think, we want to do this and we do it, and then it's the responsibility of the therapist to do that. There's no one stopping you. But if we as a manufacturer want to say that this is possible, then legislation is relevant for us as a manufacturer. And there's a concept in the 60601 standard talking about, I thought I said already, medical electrical equipment, that you can put different equipments together, and then you have a, a medical electrical system. Um, it's basically a combination of different pieces of equipment, and there come certain rules with that. Another thing is that you can state that certain devices are intended to be used together, but they are not sold together, they are not integrated at in a legal level. But you state very clearly in your user manual this is intended to be used with that device, maybe of a different brand, that's fine. Um, or you can also do something similar, but call it an accessory. And you can basically choose if you like define a commercial product as an accessory, and then you buy this from another uh, company maybe, or later, and you add it, or you make it an integrated part, and then the manufacturer of the uh, Locomat, Locoma, is responsible for providing this other commercial device, but as part of their system. So you can completely integrate it, and then to the uh, Manufacturer that sells the device is responsible for, for everything. And then you have also the thing that is called interfaces. So it's also about to interface a device 
with a network, for example, but that network doesn't become part of your device. So, so uh, internet connection is, is obvious, but actually it's not very well defined, or I'm not really aware of what's the limit of an electrical interface. So what are the, the okay, definitions in the FDR, also always important. So they talk about the system also, and that's basically a combination of products, either packaged together or not, intended to be interconnected or combined to achieve a specific medical purpose. Compatibility is the ability to work together, so things that talk with each other basically. And then you have also interoperability is defined as the ability of two or more devices, including software, from the same manufacturer or from different manufacturers to exchange information, communicate with each other, or work together as intended. So that's very broad and, and it's basically any operability that you I want, but that's just definitions. And then what's the requirement is so the, the general safety and performance requirements, Annex 1, that's basically telling you what you have to comply with. It states Devices that are intended to be operated together with other devices or products shall be designed and manufactured in a way that the interoperability and compatibility are reliable and safe. Full stop. That's the only thing that is said about it, but of course then the question is how do I show that this is safe and reliable? And there are standards that come into play, and there's still a lack of such standards in many cases, but the NDR doesn't forbid anything there. So, so in that sense, uh, yeah, it's a common and I talked a bit about these choices. We have this electrical system fully integrated, defined then as a functional connection between two or more power devices. Actually, a, a device is basically defined by having a power plug. So if you have two power plugs on your device, it's automatically already a system. Because uh, an equipment can have only one power plug. Of course, your wireless battery powered is a bit more complex. But the MES always has one manufacturer that's completely responsible of the system. So, of course, you can integrate components from other companies, but the manufacturer is responsible and has to show safety and performance. Intended to be used together, like I said, you can claim that, state it in your user manager, and if you make that claim, you're responsible to consider this in the risk management. Test, is this really safe? And then you're responsible for that. And you also have to, of course, to follow if there's an update of that product that you still maintain safe, but that can be uh, manufactured by someone else. Accessory. Um, accessory is not a medical device, but needs to have uh, its own technical documentation. I will not go into the details of that for the sake of time. Then interfaces. So you can state that your device is intended to be connected to the network or to a tablet or whatever. Um, like I said, MDR says just it has to be reliable and safe. There's a new standard on information to be supplied by the manufacturer that actually gives quite detailed instructions on what you have to specify, like the, the data format or the, the timing uh, issue. So on an abstract level, not what you have to comply with, but what have you, do you have to document so that it's clear what are the requirements to the interface. So that's actually quite helpful. And then there is a guideline in the MDR on cyber security. It's uh, yeah, it's, it's about uh, data communication, uh, data security, but also risk management effects. It's I think also quite helpful if you want to connect your device. To so that's basically what I wanted to. Uh, one more thing. There is a standard, more like a best practice standard on how to exchange clinical data. Called Fire. It's a society of companies and users. They produce an update. Uh, there's a health level seven community that uh, uh, yeah, publishes this, and it's called Fire. It's becoming more and more normative to use this in different features. But that's only talking about uh, a patient data file that I want to transfer to another device, then how do you format it, etc. Um, yeah, that's basically what I wanted to tell. Thanks for your attention. Thanks. And I'm Thanks,
we have time for questions or maybe later? Yes, I think we can take one take question, one. definitely. This uh, question. Not directly from no. the audience. Is there something in the chat? No, nothing on the chat. Nothing on the chat. I mean, I'm uh, open for questions also later, maybe. We can okay, first question. Yeah, for discussion and so on. I mean, okay, one question Is this presentation available for the people or? In principle, yes. I, I, I have to go through it if there are things. Yeah. But I would say there's nothing confidential. It would be so very nice because yeah. I think uh, the information there is really fabulous uh, about uh, what needs to be considered. So I think uh, many of us can take a huge benefit from that. So thanks for this uh, insight into not only what we need to apply, but also how you and others uh, have made this framework or because that's also I think the understanding how how uh, such standards are created or get into place uh, is, is also I think, uh, important uh, to see because that also explains a bit uh, uh, I mean standards are okay on one hand expensive but on the other hand also then you think oh but now nothing is written really and that helps me because I still have to do the work. Uh, I mean it's a jungle and I think it's important that because the basic intuition is very logical like this risk benefit balance it makes a lot of sense or, but if you just look at standards you quickly get lost in, in the jungle of documents so I hope to give a little bit also the intuition of what's the idea of this. Yeah, and you also entered a lot of uh, how you need to interpret what is written there. So I mean, uh, because it's it's uh, I think it's it's really a, a language that also you. Uh, <laughs> I learned slowly, and I was struggling with the NDR. I also learned a lot more. It's uh, it takes a lot of time. Okay, thanks, Jan. So thanks, we'll go to the next uh, presentation. Yeah. Then.